like always, I'm going to share my screen so that we can begin to see uh, the very intricate uh, plant family that is going to be uh, the member of the plumeria family. So you should already be familiar, but we get to see it in a lot more detail. And uh, here's a house of a plumeria geek, uh, somebody who belonged to the plumeria society uh, that was collecting a lot of different uh, plants and hybridizing and doing a bunch of work with them. So we get to look at uh, the Apoxini ACE family, uh, the dog bane family. And uh, it is known as dog bane because traditionally this, uh, members of these families were being used uh, whenever people wanted to get rid of their dog, they would then feed them something from this family and they'll poison the dog and they'll kill it. And that's when you're gonna see some of these plants that are gonna be referred to as dog bane, hens bane, wolf bane. It would be the plants that they would uh, try, uh, associate with uh, warding off or just killing some of those animals. So that's why the dog bane comes uh, as a family name. Uh, and now we're gonna all look into the subfamilies. So whenever there is a big plant family out there, it's often divided into different subfamilies to help out with um, the classification. Not only are these the subfamilies, but in the more traditional uh, placement of the plants, some of these were their own families at one point or another. And so the modern day has put them into uh, a underneath the umbrella of the dark pain. So just be aware, you might see them as a family in some of the old literature, but now they are under the dark pain. So five subfamilies, we get to see three, only the three more important ones that you may come across. Uh, 415 genera, obviously we're not gonna see all, 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 many of them. And there's just a little bit over 4,500 species. Uh, throughout the world. So you're gonna find some of them native to California, up uh, in the north, in the south, and almost every part of the world that has a decent climate will have members of this family from the mountains to the desert and everything in between. And if we look at the family tree, so the common ancestor uh, gave rise to several of them. Uh, the first ancestor or uh, relative to the dark bane is going to be Ruby AC, which is going to be the coffee. So yes, coffee is related or somewhat related uh, to the dark bane, or at least the common ancestor is, uh, but it branched very early on in the development. And then we have also uh, the Logani AC or the uh, Longan family uh, that falls into this uh, category, or the Jasminiaceae, which is the Carolina Jasmine. Uh, so that would also fall into this family. Or we also have the Gentia family. Uh, here's Orpheum frutescens uh, that also branch early on. And then uh, we then have our dog bane. And uh, here is uh, a very simplistic flower. Uh, this is uh, Apoxinum, which is going to be known as Indian hemp, uh, and that would be the type specimen for the family grouping. Uh, so from there, from this very simplistic flower, we'll see a lot of diversification because some of the members have become very diverse. So that would be the typical flower for a member of this family. And uh, traditionally, they have been used for people for many, many reasons. So here is uh, our first genus. This is a conchentra. Uh, it is known as, as bush, bushman poison. So in Africa, where the shrub is native to, uh, they would harvest the fruit. They would then use some of the juices on the tips of the arrows. And then when they were to penetrate the flesh of an animal, it would deliver a poison that will eventually slow down and or paralyze the animal so that the people would then be able to kill it and eat it later on. So there's the flowers of the Bushman poison and here are the fruits or the, uh, the fruits for this individual. Obviously, it should not be consumed. Uh, almost every single member of this family can, should be considered as poisonous or toxic or extremely toxin. So unless you are familiar with them and know that they're safe, 
uh, you should not be consuming or experimenting with some of these plant groups because they could be potentially deadly to human beings. And Bushman poison has been used by people for many years. Uh, and there's a fruit when they mature, they look like a plum, could be confused by, as a plum, uh, but it is not. And so when we look at the different subfamily, these are gonna be the breakdown. Uh, we're gonna have the Ravophioides uh, the Ravothia, uh, we'll see a few specimens. Some are growing here in Long Beach uh, and or are using the garden. Then we'll look at the Apoxinioides or Apoxinium. Uh, and uh, our member here is uh, the Adenium that we've already seen in class. And then uh, Asclepisioides or the Asclepias, uh, the milkweed. Uh, it used to be its own family, but now it's a subfamily of this. So this is where the lumpers have brought them together and made into a bigger family of them. So these are the three, and there's just a, a breakdown of uh, uh, the number of species or uh, genera and species uh, and where they're gonna be find, found, mainly tropical or temperate or subtropical. So they'll have a different range. So different genera and the species uh, for these groups. Uh, the biggest one will be the Asclepioides uh, that we'll see later on that are going to be probably the more diverse individuals out of the whole group. So if we begin with uh, Ravophioides, uh, that would be the first one, then we'll continue Apoxinioides and finish with uh, Asclepioides. Uh, the best specimen for uh, members of this family or this subfamily is going to be on fourth and Caronado or fourth and Redondo. There is a house that has a quinine tree. Uh, the tree is going to look like this. It's still there. It looks very healthy and very happy. And so this is also where proper ID is very important because when I saw it, I had an idea what it was going to be and I had an idea what it was going to look like. Uh, and I was picturing a tree that would be completely covered with big plumeria like flowers because I knew it was in that family related to that and so I waited many 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 years months uh, before I could see the flowers and once again I was visualizing this big tree loaded with flowers uh, and then when I finally started to see some uh, signs that it was getting ready to flowers I saw some very tiny buds uh, right here, you can kind of see them, the buds right here. Uh, then I went back to see it in flower and that's when it got pruned. So unfortunately I had to wait another year. Uh, and finally I got the chance to see the flower and the flowers were not what I expected. Uh, so what I envisioned as being a big display of plumeria like flowers turned out to be very small. So there are two flowers with my fingertip uh, for scale. And uh, it was flowering all this time. I just did not look close enough to really see uh, the flowers until I, I guess I was smart enough to look. So here's two flowers across a penny. They're going to be very, very small. Nothing like I was visualizing. So I was thinking of a very different plant that is does have big flower, but it wasn't this. So then I finally got to ID it properly. And then uh, Eventually, I got to see the fruit. Uh, are the fruits edible? The answer is in the reference, it is said that they're eaten by monkeys in Africa, but I will not experiment with them. So I've never had them. I just, I need to have some real research that says they're safe for humans to consume. Uh, but so far, I have not tasted them. And so the tree looks very nice and it's out there. And fourth and redondo, if you're in that area, uh, you might want to go and visit because there's just about three or four of these trees here in the city of Long Beach. And then as I've been traveling around, uh, this are from Cuba where I got a chance to see several other species. I have not taken the time to identify to the species level, uh, but this will be uh, some other members, including some of that fruit. Uh, and here's uh, another one. Uh, you, so you can see the flowers that look very similar. And then uh, here's just more fruits from the wild. And there's a scale and the, there's the flower. And there's a side view. 
because we'll get to see the flower in a lot more detail. Now, there is a very common plant known as natal plum. Uh, it is a very common landscape plant that you will see almost in every home throughout the city. This will also fall under this uh, subfamily. So here is uh, by the convention center going in a container and there's the side view of uh, the flowers. And so here's the top view. So here's a different species that I saw at South Coast Botanic Garden that I was able uh, to photograph. And I also found it in uh, fruit. And uh, when I squashed the fruit, it gave a, a very, very bright uh, color. And so if we look at the flowers and we analyze uh, the makeup, uh, we're going to find a few things that are going to be consistent throughout. Uh, there's going to be usually five petals. Uh, they're going to be partly fused, and many of them will have a floral tube. And you can see here a tube that is going to bring the petals up. And below that, you're going to have the five leaf-like sepals. Uh, those may be present later on on the flowers, but the sepals will obviously not play any kind of role in pollination. It's going to be the petals. So that's going to be kind of the makeup for this family. Five petals, five sepals, usually some kind of trumpet-like. Uh, and then uh, here is the fruit. Uh, the fruit could be a dry follicle that will open on one side, and then it's going to release the seeds. In most cases, the seeds are going to be dispersed by wind, and then uh, they're going to fly with a parachute or some kind of uh, wing, and hopefully they'll land in good uh, soil, and they're going to germinate and grow into a new plant. Or sometimes the fruit may be fleshy. Uh, here is uh, another member that is this, this is a plumeria. And when you look very closely at plumeria, uh, most people miss the reproductive components. The reproductive components are going to be at the base of the floral too. So they're going to be very small. What you see is going to be the petals in a very, very tiny opening. So when we take this portion and we magnify it, uh, then we have the reproductive components. We have the anthers uh, with the filament, and then we have the stigma and then the style that will later on lead to the ovary that will become the fruit later on. You need to cut it in half. You need to be very careful because they're very small reproductive components, uh, but they're gonna be there if you look for them. And plumeria fruit will also have this follicle and the follicle is known to have two segments. So it's kind of gonna kind of resemble horns uh, and that's gonna be also uh, the, uh, across the board with other members of this family. So they're going to have this bifork uh, horn uh, type fruit that will dry when it's mature and it's going to release the seeds. So these are the plumeria uh, fruit uh, that may appear in every so often. And inside is going to be the seeds. Uh, most fruits will be a dry follicle, but a few species have changed and they have uh, generated a fleshy fruit. Uh, in this case, here is the fruit for the natal plum. Uh, the members of the family will have milk or a white milky sap. That is a good indicator that you should not be eating it. However, as mentioned before, unless you are sure that it is safe like natal plum, you should not be experimenting. And obviously natal plum is edible, even though it has the milky sap, it's not gonna kill you. Uh, but this have changed their mode of distribution of seeds. So instead of allowing the wind to carry the parachute, it's gonna rely on an animal that's gonna eat the fruit, the fleshy fruit, and it's gonna drop the seed somewhere else. Uh, so there's the seeds for members of this family. And here's the follicle when it opens with the ripened seeds. Uh, and so here's uh, just a break a leaf. You're going to see that white milky sap, which is already a, a indicator that is you should be careful with and not consume any portion of it. And so if we look at the transition of the flower, here is uh, the natal plum during the bud stage. So we see the petals that are closed. We see the floral tube, and then we see the sepals towards the bottom. Then we have the open petal, uh, and then you have a tiny opening. 
most of these plants will rely on either a moth or a butterfly or some other insect animal that have a very thin proboscis because that animal has to uh, put their proboscis into that tiny opening to be able to drink the nectar, but in the process bring about pollination. So most of this may be fragrant because they want to attract a moth or a butterfly or something like that. And so when pollination takes place, now we have the beginnings of the fruit. And you can see that ovary that is way at the bottom that is now beginning to swell. And you have here in dark, a little bit darker would be the remnants of that stigma and the style. And then you have the sepals that will be associated with the fruit as well. So they don't die off as with other plants. Uh, that will then lead to the mature fruit. Here is when it has now changed color, the fully ripened ovary. And you still see the sepals that are associated with them, part of the flower. And now you have a beautiful natal plum uh, ready to eat. There are some plants that will have a lot of benefits for humans. So this is catharanthus. Keep mentioning the plant is toxic, it is poisonous, which means that it does have a potential for medicine. And so catharanthus is a plant that is providing people with uh, the ability to uh, be used for chemotherapy. So for leukemia for children, uh, if they receive any kind of chemotherapy, it would be a compound that is derived from uh, this vinca or cataranthus from Madagascar uh, as well, so native to Madagascar. So there is some benefit. Obviously, the same compound will probably get you to the hospital if you were to ingest this plant. Uh, but there are some potentials for medications. Uh, so. Vinca catharanthus, it's a very popular plant. It's going to be an annual, or there's going to be the other vinca uh, that is going to be used as a ground cover, also very, very popular. Uh, and here's the flowers. And when we look at its side view, we see exactly the same thing as uh, we've seen before, the sepals, the floral tube, and the petals. The opening is a lot wider so it's now inviting other insects not just the butterflies and or the moths and then there's a uh, cerbera which is a genus from southeast asia into the pacific islands uh, known as suicide tree and that gives you a clue why it's called like that because people probably have been ingesting it and they have caused suicide or they if they wanted to die they would eat the fruit or this plant uh, so here is uh, the flower with all the different components. And uh, here is the face view of the flowers, so showing you that tiny opening. Uh, and uh, here's just some other wild member of this family from uh, Cuba uh, that I came across in my travels. Uh, so I, and I don't know uh, the genus uh, or the species yet. Uh, and then we have the regular plumeria that we've seen. So here is a plumeria rubra. Uh, that I mentioned before is native to Mexico. And here are the seeds. So they have a net because we want to make sure not to lose them. Uh, so the seeds of the plumeria will spread through uh, the wind with a wing. Uh, and then here is uh, just prime for scale. And this is the Polynesian plumeria. So plumeria acutifolia. It's not as showy as the Mexican uh, varieties, and also is not as hardy or as big. So it's been grown by several people here in Long Beach, uh, but obviously most people prefer the more colorful, the bigger, uh, the more uh, hardier uh, Mexican variety and the different hybrid. And there's a few other species out there. So here's one uh, from uh, Asia or also from the Pacific Islands. Here's uh, been grown in uh, Martinique. It's also been grown here. And uh, I was very fortunate that in my trip through Cuba, I was able to find different wild plumerias growing out there. Uh, could they be used for hybridizing and create new ones? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so here's a white uh, plumeria uh, in the wild. And uh, here's just another plant that I came across uh, in Cuba, and just several, I think I found like about five different species. And even this one uh, growing by the coast uh, with cacti, 
and the leaves are very, very narrow, almost willow-like. Uh, and uh, here's the flowers, so white with a little bit of yellow. And uh, so here's more of the flowers. And this one also has the fruit in the wild. So there's the fruit, uh, the double horn uh, uh, fruit, dry fruit. So very interesting. So but prior to this trip to Cuba, I rarely seen them in the wild. So I got a chance to see a couple of them. Uh, and here's in Cuba being cultivated uh, as a large shrub. Uh, and uh, this one is being grown here, not too far from the campus. Uh, here in Long Beach, and just the many hybrids uh, that have been uh, generated from the Mexican variety. So there is a now a Plumeria display, display uh, the LA County Arboretum, and these are some of the uh, hybrids that were placed by the Hibis, uh, Plumeria Society uh, that is going around. Uh, and then there's going to be a few other plants that may be referred to as gardenia, uh, keeping in mind that gardenia belongs to the coffee family, which is going to have some resemblance because, as we've seen before, uh, they come from a common ancestor. Uh, but the genus Taberna Montana uh, may be sold as a perennial gardenia or ever-blooming gardenia. Uh, the flowers look like uh, the starch uh, nettle plum. Uh, and here's a few other species that I came across. Uh, most of these are going to be either from Asia or South America. And then there's uh, the genus Tevithia, which is going to give us the yellow oleander. Uh, it is a very popular plant here growing at uh, Long Beach State. And uh, here's uh, the uh, yellow flowers. Again, it has a tube, it has the petals, kind of creating a tube. And uh, here's the face uh, for that. And this is the fruit. Uh, the fruit have several uses. Uh, so here's the fruit when it's mature, and uh, it has kind of like a shell, which I often have seen the word uh, Indian, uh, Indian almond. Uh, so it is sold as that. I want to caution you because there, a couple of years ago, there was a fad about eating uh, this fruit as a way of managing the weight. Uh, and so they were saying that you can take the amount of a rice grain or the size of a rice grain and eat it. And what's going to happen, that was going to empty your stomach, either to the top or the bottom. And by emptying your stomach, it was going to uh, prevent you from absorbing the calories and you're going to lose weight. There has been several deaths associated with this. So yes, the amount of a rice or the size of a rice grain is enough to empty your stomach and any more is enough to probably put you in the hospital and eating an entire seed was probably going to kill you. Uh, and so I would not recommend that you consume uh, the seed from this, even though you may see it as a way of managing weight. So again, there's easier way to keep your waistline and not through eating this horrible tasting fruit. And it tastes horrible because it's loaded with a lot of chemicals and toxins. Uh, but traditionally in uh, Central and South America, it has been used for music. So this is what you might see some of the Aztec dancers. Uh, they put them around their ankles and they sound like a rattle. And so it's a shell from uh, uh, this specific fruit, uh, and there's when they were being sold. So here's uh, Tabithia tibitioides. Uh, so this is the bigger yellow leander. Uh, I think this is by the circle. Uh, it can become a large uh, specimen, and here's where it's almost the size of a tree. Uh, and I was able to photograph it when it was in full flower. Uh, so it can be quite nice. Uh, it's used around the parks. It's used around the freeways. Uh, and here's uh, a uh, species that I saw in uh, Botanic Garden in Chiapas, Mexico, Tabithia uh, Ahuayi. And so I was able to photograph uh, the flowers uh, and also the fruit. Uh, the most toxic component will be found on the seeds in this case, but the poison is also on the flowers and uh, the leaves and every part of the plant, but definitely do not eat any portion of the seeds or you may up in the hospital uh, and this one's turned red uh, when they mature. 
So that takes care of the uh, first uh, subfamily, Rav Ravophioides, and now let's go to Apaxinioides, because this will be the bigger flowers, and it will be the showy individual. Here's Apaxinium cannabinum, uh, commonly known as Indian hemp. Uh, this photograph is from New York, and uh, they do take the stems, and they will harvest a fiber. Uh, Native Americans use it for making ropes and or for making clothing and a bunch of other uh, products. So Indian hemp, you might see it under the name, uh, just growing in a big thicket. And this also makes its way into California. So it is a California native as well. Here growing on a cliff or on the side next to a stream. Uh, and here's just the simplistic flowers. Uh, the flowers may be open. And so any kind of insect will be able to feast on the nectar and the pollen. And some of them may have a floral tube and some of them may not. Uh, and so here's uh, the close up of the flowers. Uh, so you have the petals and everything else. And then we have the adenium or that uh, desert rose that we've seen before. Here's a very nice specimen in the Berkeley greenhouse. Uh, so here's uh, some of the ones that you may find in the store. And if we look at the flowers, it's exactly the same as the previous ones. You have the sepals, you have a floral tube, and then you have the petals, in this case, making a larger trumpet so that the insect can land. And here is going to be the reproductive component uh, of the face. Uh, we have a few other big individuals. So within this family groups, you're going to have everything. You're going to have tiny herbaceous, you're going to have some succulents, you're going to have some vine or climbing individuals, and you may also get some trees. So the entire spectrum of life form is found here. And so here is what they refer to as Easter lily vine, only because it looks like a lily. Uh, here is growing in uh, Long Beach, and uh, it will bear a very large flower and very, very showy. Uh, do not confuse it with any of trumpet or anything else because you can still see the sepals, the trump, uh, the two, and then the petals and everything else. Uh, so you may see it here and there. Uh, it's just a few homes who still have it here in Long Beach. Uh, or the Mandevilla, these are very common. Uh, you're going to find them in Home Depot. They're available now. Uh, it's a vine that is not going to be too aggressive or too big, uh, and it's going to give you lots of flowers or more common will be the oleander. And it's amazing how poisonous this plant is and how much it has been planted. Even around children, play areas, schools, you would find oleanders. Very, very toxic. Uh, if uh, a regular human uh, will die if they consume a single leaf. Uh, there has been many incidents of children uh, getting poison uh, by using the sticks to roast marshmallows when they were in camps or in a campground. So that is enough to put a child in a hospital. Uh, so do not eat it. Here is uh, the beginning of the flowers. So once again, the petals in yellow, we have the floral tube and then the sepals. Here we have uh, the open flower. And in oleanders, we're going to have some appendages, just an extension of some of those, uh, the floral tube. And then we also have the fruit. Most people will probably never seen the fruit, but here's the dry fruit of uh, the oleander that will eventually open and release the seeds. There are different forms out there. Here's the double multi-petal uh, peach color or pink color, or here's even, even more flowering multi-petal peach uh, and there's uh, the close-up of this. And then uh, Madagascar palm, Pachyporium. So here's the one like on 22nd and uh, walnut, so uh, walking distance from the campus. So this will be a mature specimen that is uh, flowering right now. Uh, but here it is in the wild. So I was very fortunate to visit South Africa, uh, Namibia, South Africa, and I was able to see them in the wild. So here's uh, in a botanic garden uh, where they were growing. And uh, depending on where you go, here is uh, Fullerton Arboretum where they have a Madagascar display. Uh, so here is uh, the Madagascar palm uh, with flowers on display. 
and or here is uh, South Coast Botanic Garden with their specimen, or when people grow them in a container, as mentioned in class, uh, that's how they will look. And this one is beginning to branch and those are two individuals planted. So it could be quite nice. And here are the flowers. I mentioned they kind of look like plumeria and there's my hand for scale, but they're gonna be a lot bigger than plumeria. Uh, most likely pollinator would be a moth or some butterfly, which will have a very thin proboscis to be able to take the nectar from the flowers. Uh, and then there's gonna be climbing uh, members of this family. So the genus Tropanthus, sometimes they're referred to as climbing plumeria uh, or some other different names. So here they are in uh, New York, it's uh, tropical. So this one will require a nice greenhouse, but they are gonna be known for having an extension of the petals and they're gonna be very, very long. So this extension go all the way to the bottom here. Uh, and then here's uh, the close up. So here's, here they are. So they're kind of twisting and twining. So that's just the tips of the petals extending very, very far. Uh, and there's a close up of this individual and there you can see the sepals and everything else and the reproductive structures inside. And there's a different picture of this. Uh, and so this is gonna also be very, very nice. Here's the Astropanthus gregatum, uh, climbing oleander for this uh, species or the common name. And here's uh, this one, and not as uh, extensive or not, the tips of the petals do not extend as much. So can some of them grow here? The answer is yes. I've grown this one here outdoors and it's actually growing outdoors right now. Uh, and it has flower. Uh, so here's a different species uh, for this individual. And then this one is growing outdoors in uh, Fullerton. So this is the Fullerton Arboretum and it's a shrub, uh, but when I've visited many times, I've gotten the chance to see it in full flower growing outdoors for many years. Uh, and it will be something that is gonna be unusual. And here's the fruit, the fruit, the two horns, this one already opening and releasing the seeds with uh, the parachute. So different species, many hardy enough to grow around here. Or there's gonna be the climbing uh, plumeria, which uh, is this genus here. This one would be too tropical, a photograph taken in Florida uh, where it's a lot warmer. So I wish it would grow here because it could be quite nice, uh, but I think it may, we may get a little bit too cold yet. Uh, but very, very common in all of the landscape is gonna be the star jasmine, Trachylosperma, used as a ground cover throughout the landscape. So when you see the flower, uh, here it is. And the name star jasmine, only because it looks like a star and it may resemble jasmine but obviously it is not, uh, and you probably don't want to eat. Uh, but that was a botanical blunder. I keep saying that it is very important that you ID plants properly. And so when I came across this uh, advertisement from Coffee Tree and Tea Leaf, uh, it's uh, making brag about how wonderful their dragon pearl tea is. And so we can analyze this uh, from a botanical standpoint. Uh, and it could be the tea that it is coming from a tea plant or a camellia that is grown uh, in Asia in some of the mountains that it then goes through a process of fermentation or just uh, being roasted so that you can then have your green tea. Or could it be the jasmine? This is a true jasmine, Arabian uh, jasmine that is used for flavoring the teas and many other drinks. But when we look at the photograph, somebody just probably went out to the landscape. They took a star jasmine and that is what they use in the photograph uh, to call for the jasmine component. Uh, and so, yeah, there is no doubt that this might be the best tea in the world. And that is only because if you drink it, you probably die and nobody's gonna argue because they're probably gonna be dead. So yeah, they can make the claim. I'm not gonna argue, I'm not gonna try it. It's gonna be poisonous if enough actually in fact had this specific flower. 
Uh, and in California, we do have this genus, Cycladenia. Uh, it is native to California, but it's native to the mountains. So this would be a high altitude. Uh, here it is in full flower with fruits. Uh, and you can see the fruits, the double horn. So if you ever hike on the high mountains, you may be able to see this uh, genus uh, Cycladenia as a California native individual. It's quite nice. Does not grow by the coast, so it's a mountain species. And then uh, there will be exceptions. There's always an exception to the rules. Here's Fernandia. Uh, and uh, for many years, I did not realize that this flower is a member of uh, the dog vein family and it should be considered poisonous. Uh, here is uh, the reproductive structure. But it is, in fact, eaten by people, and it has been eaten by people for many, many, many years. Uh, this is uh, what they refer to in Central America as loroco, and it's what uh, the Salvadorians use for making pupusas and or making a bunch of other dishes. So since then, I have found other cultures that would use a flower or similar flowers for members of this family that would normally be poisonous but they were able to either prepare them or find the ones that were safe to eat, including Loroco, which every member, every brother, sister may be poisonous, but this plant is uh, safe to eat or the flowers are safe to eat and they are can grow around here. So that takes care of the Apaxionioides. Now let's go to the Asclepidioides because this will be a very diverse group of plants. Now we are gonna have a very weird plant that is gonna be separated from the others. Uh, we have the petals and the sepals, but they no longer are gonna form a floral tube. Uh, so they're almost gonna look like a star. So we have the petals here in orange. And then we have some important unique components. Uh, there is gonna be a hood and a horn. Uh, this is going to be classic of uh, the milkweeds and or the Hoyas. And then on top of that, or in the middle, is going to be the style. So this is where the pollen will need to be deposited. Uh, members of this uh, subfamily have also gone to the extreme of delivering the pollen in the pollinia or the pa 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 packet, like we saw with the orchids. So the pollen is just gonna be in small pockets that will be stuck probably to the foot of a butterfly of an insect. And that's how it's gonna be delivered to uh, the style of the plant. So in the process of drinking the nectar, inevitably the insect is going to stick their foot into the hood and uh, then they're gonna get uh, the pollen stuck to them. So that's how the pollination is gonna work. So if we cut the flower in half, so you can see uh, the structure, we still have the sepals, but no longer that floral tube. We just have an extension uh, of this uh, kind of column. We have the style uh, that would lead to the ovary. Uh, and then we have the horns and the hood. And here is where the pollen sac would be or the pollen packets. That was where they're gonna be. And so we have Asclepias, or the genus for the milkweed, that are going to be very, very important. So here's the, some of the yellow ones, and uh, here's some of the red ones. Asclepias corasivica, this is the South American or Brazilian species. Uh, and uh, there is some medicinal value to this. I've seen this in some of the Mexican herbal spice section, and I would not drink this, but I guess some people will use it for some kind of medicinal value or for something. Uh, and so I was able to photograph this. Uh, but we do have some California native milkweed. Uh, so here we have uh, Asclepias fascicularis, the narrow leaf uh, milkweed. That would have been grown around here in Southern California. There's still some population. Uh, the name milkweed obviously is because there's some milk associated with it, but the weed component is simply a mislabel because when they started appearing in some of the agriculture fields, obviously they were a noxious weed and they got to exterminate them. 
we know that this is a very important food source for the butterflies, the monarchs. So this is the only plant that they can eat. And so now the big movement is to put back some more milkweed or plant some more milkweed so that the butterflies have an opportunity to, to reproduce. The butterflies and the milkweed had a, have a very long history. And so the toxins, the toxic compounds that you find in the milkweed are used by the butterflies to protect themselves from their own predators, making the monarch butterfly also poisonous to birds and other animals. And so that relationship cannot be broken, but if there's no milkweed for the butterflies to lay their eggs and the caterpillars to feed on, then the monarchs are gonna go uh, extinct. So if you're in Southern California, this would be the native milkweed that you will find here. And as you travel from North to South, uh, milkweeds are gonna change and all of them can be fed by the monarchs or the butterflies They each have their own individual chemical component. Uh, so here is uh, the butterfly, the monarch, uh, feeding on uh, the milkweeds, uh, the flowers. So you can see the proboscis as it's probing for the nectar, uh, for the narrow leaf. And then also around here, this is uh, Asclepias aerocarpa or uh, the cotton leaf. Uh, I happen to find this one when I went with Ariel on a hiking trip in Whittier. She told me she saw it and she didn't know what it was and then we found it. So yeah, it's an Asclepias, it's a milkweed. It is also native to California. So this would be the second uh, native milkweed for this coastal area of California. And uh, here's uh, the flowers uh, for this individual uh, covered with a lot of hairs. Uh, you might see it or you might not because uh, the monarchs may eat them before you get a chance to find them in photograph. We were lucky to find this one in flower. So Asclepias aerocarpa. And then if you happen to head on to the desert, uh, this one is desert milkweed, Asclepias. Uh, and Asclepias that do not, does not have any leaves. Uh, I think Asclepias uh, scorpioides, I think, uh, but it's only stems uh, because obviously in the desert it's gonna be a lot hotter. Uh, and drier, so it's gonna be just kind of succulent stems that will keep this plant alive. And uh, it happens to be flowering here on display at the Fullerton Arboretum. Uh, and uh, I also got a chance to photograph a big tarantula hawk uh, at the Fullerton Arboretum as it was uh, feeding on the pollen and the nectar or the nectar of the flower. Uh, and here is another milkweed. So I don't know the species of this, but this is from the Mojave uh, Desert. Uh, so it's growing uh, just in a wash in sandy uh, soil. And uh, here I was able to photograph the flowers. And uh, I was also able to photograph another uh, tarantula hawk, this one in the wild, uh, which would be probably one of the natural pollinators for this big a flower, so a big uh, wasp, a tarantula wasp. Uh, and then as you venture into South America, Central and South America, this would be in Mexico, in Michoacan. Uh, this is the pine leaf milkweed. So as the monarch migrate from north to south, they have to have the milkweed along the route to lay the eggs and continue on with the generations. And so, the ones that I mentioned before are here in the north. There's going to be a lot more that I have not encountered. Uh, and then as they go into the south, then they'll kind of encounter this uh, pine leaf, uh, leaf uh, milkweed. And uh, if they're the monarchs from South America, then they'll encounter the carosabica or the tropical milkweeds. So there's a very nice slender leaf that will kind of look like pine needles. And that's where they come and get the name. Or we have some bigger uh, uh, individuals. So here's uh, more of a shrubby. Uh, here is uh, uh, Asclepia spisocarpa, uh, which means uh, tomato-like fruit. So like the tomatillo, uh, because the fruit is going to be enclosed uh, in this uh, papery covering uh, that has kind of like hairs. And so inside is where you're gonna find uh, the seeds and the fruit uh, that will split later on. So that will be a bigger individual. And then uh, in Chiapas, now we start getting into the tropical ones. Uh, these are some of the species that I happen to see. 
uh, in my travels. Uh, and so this is a milkweed. Uh, here's a different individual. And this one had a lot of weevils that were kind of feeding on them. And what's interesting to me is that some of the weevils may look like the actual horns and the hood here. So that is a weevil's head. So I'm not sure if there's a relationship there, but I found a lot of weevils that were feeding and having a party and mating and uh, carrying out life on top of a milkweed. Uh, and so here's, uh, here they are, happy. Uh, and uh, even a fly that happened to be there, uh, that could also be the pollinator for this in the wild. Uh, and the monarch butterflies, uh, I mentioned in Michoacan, obviously that is where they go and they sleep. So I had an opportunity to go there. And yes, it is a very beautiful sight to see all these monarchs just hanging from the trees, waiting for winter to go by. And uh, then they'll fly back uh, and migrate or they will have to lay their eggs and their next generation will fly back. And that's how they have migrated for many years. So we have that as a very important relationship between a plant and the butterfly. Uh, or there's also the cruel plant. Uh, this, you may see it growing here and there. It's treated like a weed. Uh, it's known as a cruel plant because uh, when the moth or bee happens to uh, take the nectar, somehow there's a mechanism where the plant flower will trap the mouth of the insect and it'll keep it until it dies. So it's a very cruel way of living or dying. And so that's why, why the plant is called cruel. Uh, so here's uh, just the samples and everything that we've talked about before. And here's the fruit uh, for this individual. I don't know if people eat it when it's young. I do get the feeling that that's why it was brought here. Or we have the tropical milkweed, and this would be a very large shrub. And I, I was convinced that it would not grow here until I started seeing it in some of the Cambodian neighborhoods. So this is not too far from the campus. Uh, and it does have a very large flower. And so here's a perfect shot of this uh, stigma right there. Uh, and here is uh, more of a, a different selection with more colorful flowers. Uh, this is uh, in Suriname. In, so here's some of the flowers. And here it is when it has escaped, or maybe in the wild, this is uh, Cuba. So you can see how it looks. Uh, and here's the flowers as they are uh, opening. Uh, and there's some of the open flowers. Uh, and then there's gonna be a different genus. This is known as Cyropigia. We'll see string of hearts later on. Uh, so they have changed their flowers. So now we're gonna see a very different uh, adaptation. Uh, the flowers are gonna create a very narrow tube. They're almost gonna look like a pipe. Uh, and so here is uh, the beginning or the opening. And so there's the flower that is already fully open. Uh, and uh, here's a different view. So when we cut that in half, we're gonna have exactly the same. So imagine a milkweed that is able to extend the petals, eventually fuse them and just have one opening. And so now the insect is gonna be forced to come in here, probably a very tiny fly and uh, be able to take the nectar and somehow deliver the pollen sac, the pollinium that you see right here to the stigma. And then you have, uh, uh, the style and everything else, and even some of those structures that we saw with the milkweed. So this is a very different uh, modification for probably fly pollination. And that's why they have this dark purple brown coloration. Uh, so there's the flower right there. So that's the base. So, and then, so there's a connection or where the petals fuse uh, together with one another to create uh, this pipe-like thing. So, and there's uh, the tip. So at the tip, uh, the petals are also fused. Uh, so very weird, very interesting. There's gonna be different types of uh, uh, this uh, seropigias. Uh, so here is also the fruit, the fruit characteristic of the family, it's two horns. Uh, and here's uh, seropigia ampliata, uh, this one being green. And so here's where the petals fuse or the individual petals. Uh, and it's a succulent, no leaf. And I grew this one a while back. Uh, and there's the side view of this one. And then the face view. 
and then the top view of the flower uh, and there's another side view or our Seropigia aristolithioides uh, here with this very nice uh, flowers and there's uh, the opening for the flowers or uh, Seropigia dicotoma this is more of a, a succulent uh, it almost looks like the pencil cactus but it will have leaves and I was able to grow it in flower uh, not too long ago. And those are the flowers. So they merit a lot more attention. I think there's a lot of Seropigia collectors, uh, as well as Hoya. And this would probably be the more colorful and or the one that people would like to grow the most. Uh, the common name is wax flower because that's how the flowers may resemble. And when you look at them, they're going to feel almost as if, as if they're made out of wax. So it's gonna be a little bit more colorful than uh, some of those uh, milkweed, but uh, producing a cluster. And so here is the individual flowers. So we have the petals, and then we have all of those reproductive components, including that pollinia or the pollen sac. And there is the pollen sacs when I extracted them from the Hoya. So you can see the size comparing them uh, to my finger. And so here are some of the Hoyas, and I don't know the name for all of them. And some of them I got uh, when I gone into somebody's collection and I photographed them, but they all could be quite nice. I still have a Hoya Magraviana. This would be one of the biggest ones. Uh, it's still in the greenhouse, uh, but it is a very, very nice, big, big Hoya. Uh, and uh, most people will pay a lot of money for it because once it's in flower, everybody wants it. Uh, or we have some in, from somebody's collection. I was able to photograph this individual that almost looks like porcelain. Uh, the flowers may look like porcelain. They're very, very nice and attractive. Or something like this. And I wish I would know the name. Maybe at some point I'll take the time to ID them and get the name correctly. Or here's uh, another smaller individual. And as you see different species of Hoya, there's uh, a lot of Hoya collectors. Most of the ones that we have acquired has been somebody whose family member has passed away and they want to donate the Hoyas to us or they just gotten too big and they don't want them anymore. Uh, and that's how we end up with many of the Hoyas that we have in the garden. Uh, but these are from uh, just somebody's collection of different Hoyas, well collection because they propagate them and they sell them uh, to different people, whoever wants to buy them. And so it has, um, this is Mike Cartus or Cartus Greenhouse. And so I always wanted to buy the big one, but obviously that was his propagation material. So he would only sell small ones and that's the flowers uh, for this uh, specific Hoya. Or here's uh, the hard Hoya that you might see during Valentine's because it has a uh, leaf that say shape of a heart or uh, the shooting star Hoya. Uh, this is now more of a common thing that you will see in the trade because the flowers may look like a shooting star uh, or the porcelain Hoya, uh, Hoya Bella. That is also uh, kind of common. And uh, the other weird varieties that I come across. I think this, uh, this might be the heart. And yeah, they're all very nice. They're all very weird. They're all very interesting. Uh, and here's more of the collection of the other Hoyas. And this one's almost purple black, uh, kind of like a lot of stars. Uh, there's a different view and a very close view of these flowers. Uh, so if you're a Hoya lover, uh, this uh, there's a lot of very interesting things for you to find. And then we have Stephanotis. We've seen this before, a uh, bridal bouquet. Again, very similar to everything else we've seen. Uh, and there's the flower. Uh, and uh, inside, uh, that's the reproductive component. So it kind of looks like uh, those Hoyas, only a little bit bigger. So there's the stamens with the pollen sacs. Uh, and here's the fruit that I mentioned. It also looks like an avocado. And inside, uh, those would be the seeds. If those were mature, but I cut it open. And then as you travel north and south, uh, this may be the genus Sarcostema, uh, just growing on adobe houses uh, in Jalisco, Mexico. And here's uh, the kind of nice star-shaped green flower. Or uh, this one was in Cuba uh, with a very nice, uh, uh, also star-shaped flower. 
And then there's uh, Telosma, and this is here in Long Beach. Uh, and I started seeing them in the markets, and then later on I saw the flowers uh, or the plants being grown. So here's uh, the flowers. And so this would be another of those flowers that I mentioned that people would use them in stews and soups or for human consumption. So it's now, they're now available for purchase at the local markets or now plants are also available for growing around here and they kind of grow quite well. And then uh, this one is a peanut butter uh, flower because the flowers smell like peanut butter and I was able to grow it and see the flowers. So micro micro uh, I got it from the full Arboretum and I don't think I'll be able to get it again, but it's very nice flower. I wish I had it. And then uh, a wild form. Uh, this is in Chiapas, Mexico that I came across. Very interesting. And I, I don't know the name, uh, but it's definitely a member of this. And then in Madagascar, so I mentioned earlier uh, with the Madagascar jasmine uh, palm and uh, the spiny forest in Madagascar. So here's the Madagascar ocotillo, also loaded with spines. And amongst the Madagascar ocotillo and uh, the Madagascar palm, there is a kind of trailing succulent uh, Falotia, which is in the same family as uh, uh, this uh, dark vein. And so this would be kind of how it grows. It's just going to twist and twine and grow up uh, some of these spiny shrubs. And uh, it's just a bunch of sticks or a bunch of stems. And they will flower. And the flowers look like miniature Hoyas or miniature member of this family. Then there is the very weird Stapelia. Uh, the genus Tapelia is going to be from South Africa and Africa, and it's going to be a succulent terrestrial plant. Uh, but they're going to have a very weird method of propagation. So here's in the wild, kind of taking refuge underneath other shrubs for a little bit for protection from the sun. They are going to know, be known as starfish flowers because they kind of look like starfish. But I want you to notice the color. The color is going to be kind of dark purplish brown and with lots of hairs. Uh, and so they are going to use flies as a pollinator. And so when the flowers open the first day, they're going to stink. They're going to smell like a rotten or a dead mouse. Uh, and it, you're going to smell it from a couple of feet, or if you put your nose up to the flowers, you will definitely get a blast from it. So it's going to be not a pleasant fragrance. Um, but the mimicry is so good that you will definitely see flies going to the flowers. And even the flies are going to fool into laying their eggs, thinking that this is an actual rotten animal or rotten meat. Uh, so those eggs are not going to do anything. There's nothing for them to eat or feast on, so they're going to die. So in the process of this fly trying to look for an area to lay its eggs, it's going to come in contact with the pollen sac and take it with it. And eventually it may go to a different flowers to lay more eggs, and that's how it's going to bring about pollination. So if we look at the center of that flower, here we have the hood. We have the petals that are fused. And uh, notice the lines would be as if the flesh is already rotten when the blood just spews out of the veins and you have that necrotic look uh, or necrotic look on the flesh. And then we have the style or the head and then we have the pollinium or the pollen sac right there. Same thing as we've seen before. And so here is the center and there is a fly right now here looking for a place to lay its egg. And so you have hairs because mammals do have hairs. Uh, and uh, here's uh, where I kind of looked at that and also my finger or my skin that it's almost mimicking the same color uh, as the plant. So that's uh, the attraction. And so here's uh, an entire grouping of flies fighting to lay their eggs on this flower, thinking that it is an actual uh, rotten dead animal uh, for their uh, larva to feed on, uh, which that's not going to happen. And uh, here's them, eggs, and uh, eventually the maggots in the center of the flower that were laid by those flies. Uh, and so here's uh, 
Here they are growing at South Coast uh, Botanic Garden. They are very common. They're flowering right now. I've seen people put them in Instagram all the time because uh, it's like, ooh, something weird. Like, nah, it's Apelia. Uh, and so here is uh, a little bit darker purple. Uh, and there is a center for this uh, very nice flower. Uh, and here's just a different one that we've grown here. Uh, and there's the center of the flower. And there's here's uh, Stapelia dendereci. And this one forms more of a tube. And uh, I might still have this one. I'm hoping to still have one. Uh, but there's the side of the flower and there's the center. And inside is exactly the same thing as before. The fruit as members of this family is a double horn dry fruit. So there's a fruit uh, growing out in a plant here. And there's a different view. Our uh, other members uh, closely related to this, uh, Wernia, uh, here's uh, just the same flower, same mechanism, uh, stinks, smells, uh, or Orbea, once again, looking like rotten meat, or here's a different Orbea, uh, and, uh, or uh, some of this uh, other succulent here with the flowers. And this is a collection of different ones. Uh, this is from Kew Botanic Gardens with uh, those weird flowers. And so here's a collection, uh, growing in clay pots, just kind of laying on top sometimes. So that's how they root and they'll get them to grow and use them for this place. And some of them had some very nice flower. Or the other genus that became very popular, once again, big uh, craze for managing your waistline or for losing weight is the genus Hoodia. So you might still see Hoodia pills, products sold out there for losing weight, supposed to curb your appetite. Uh, and incidentally, uh, in South Africa, they devastated some of the wild populations because people kept looking and wanting to lose their pounds, extra pounds, and they used to eat this plant. So here it is growing in the wild. The plant is right here. Uh, and there's the Huria gorgoni, which is the one that is used uh, for making those products. And uh, here's the uh, the, the fruit, so the dry seed pods, uh, double horns, and uh, here's the flowers, very small, very cryptic. Uh, and there I am for scale in the wild in Africa next to probably a very old uh, hoodia. So when I went there, obviously you cannot collect. The government started protecting them, which was good. And only a few selected people were allowed to grow them so that they can then supply them to the market for making those pills that will allow you to keep your waistline. And so here's where they have, uh, they're growing them in different containers. Can they grow out here? Yes, but keep them very, very dry because they can rot very, very quickly. Uh, so Huria Gorgoni, during this time that became the craze for losing weight. Uh, and there's some of the baby plants uh, that would go later on. And then there's a few other weird uh, members of this family that are kind of going to look like rocks. Uh, so here's uh, with the Loki or something like that. Uh, this is from a collection at either a cactus show or uh, uh, Berkeley uh, Botanic Garden or uh, UC Davis Botanic, uh, not Botanic Garden, but Greenhouse. So the stems are going to be succulent and they're going to look like rocks. Uh, so here's the flowers uh, just growing kind of out of the side of the base uh, and uh, or here's different view or here's uh, the plant. The plant looks very almost with warts uh, and there's the buds and here's the flowers. The flowers are very weird. Uh, here's uh, the close up of them in extended petals with hairs uh, again, looking like a rock with flowers. It's probably cryptic. Uh, probably also a way of tolerating the dryness and all of that. Uh, and there's the side view of the flowers uh, and in a closer view of them. And here's a different species. Uh, this is probably from the same area. So on top of the stem, you have those flowers. And here's uh, the close up of those that look almost like a Hoya or members of this family. And or another one here. Uh, kind of looking like ugly and there's a very tiny flower uh, for that and it's a close-up of that and so with this uh, me for scale uh, in front of Huria uh, which I swear I did not collect it any I will end uh, this presentation so are there any questions 
on this family. And has anybody had the Huria before? Any questions? Yeah. Nope. All right, so then I'll start recording. All right, have a great day and I will see some of you later and I'll see some of you next week. If not, have a good weekend, bye.